morning. Uh, my name is Or Segal, and I'm going to talk to you about serverless security. Uh, from the uh, conversation I had yesterday during the happy hour, I got the sense or the feeling that not everybody understands exactly what serverless is. I'm going to spend maybe two minutes uh, just explaining the concept, and then we'll jump to serverless security. Uh, but before that, uh, a little bit about me. My name is Ori Segal. I'm the CTO and co-founder of a small startup called uh, PureSec based out of Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, that invented the serverless security space uh, back in 2016. Uh, I've been involved in application security since the end of the 90s. Uh, was fortunate enough to work on the research of some uh, uh, industry-leading products like IBM AppScan and Akamai Kona Cloud Security. And those of you who are old enough to remember uh, Sanctum AppShield, which was the world's first web application firewall, and actually had the patent for that. Uh, I'm also the author of uh, 20 patents in the field of application security, mostly around static analysis, dynamic analysis, uh, interactive application security testing, and uh, also published a few, uh, I guess, popular or uh, known uh, security articles, uh, research uh, articles, uh, one of which uh, pretty much gives my age, uh, the Apache Remote Code Execution back in 2002. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm also the guitarist uh, of the Israeli uh, popular art rock band called Pits. Um, if you're into uh, alternative uh, noisy uh, music, you can go ahead and download our albums. Um, so I have about 35 minutes today, uh, and so I'm going to try to concentrate on what's really important. We'll quickly cover what is serverless security, what, what what am I actually talking about when I'm saying serverless security? I uh, will focus on a few risks and pitfalls. Uh, Dave actually mentioned some of them are very relevant. And then we'll see a live demo of how we hack a real world serverless application. That's going to be a, a good experience uh, to understand the problems as well as the benefits of serverless. Uh, and then I, I uh, created a short list of action items for you guys. Um, so I promised I'll explain what serverless is, uh, but very quickly, uh, serverless is the, the latest uh, abstraction in the cloud model. Uh, you know, if you look historically at how people uh, deployed applications, uh, starting with bare metal and then VMs, uh, containers, and now serverless, uh, the main things to notice is that uh, people are losing interest in being able to uh, manage infrastructure, uh, in uh, deploying things, taking care of security patches, and so forth. And on the other side, want to concentrate on uh, their core business logic and what they know to do uh, best. So this is where serverless takes us. That's the latest uh, abstraction or the latest step in this uh, evolution. Uh, specifically, the benefits from serverless, first of all, there are no servers for you to manage. And yes, there are servers somewhere underneath everything uh, uh, that, that you're using, but you don't really care about them. Um, continuous scaling, so you don't have to worry about capacity planning and scaling. Uh, if you have an API, it can scale from one uh, user at a time uh, to thousands of concurrent executions. Um, you're being billed by the millisecond or 100 millisecond intervals in most cases. Um, and of course, from a security perspective, you have a lot less to worry about. Uh, and we'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, just to give you a, a, a quick uh, you know, explanation of how serverless security uh, has been um, approached, uh, looking at the, the first three years of serverless, if we're looking at AWS Lambda uh, launch in 2014 as uh, the epoch uh, here. Uh, then in the beginning, people said, it's not my servers. I don't have to care. I just have to care about the, um, I don't know, some, uh, how my uh, applications handle inputs. Uh, and today, people understand that that's not really uh, what's going on. There's still a lot for you to worry about, a lot of you to, uh, things that you have uh, to take care of. And we'll get back to that. Um, the shared model of responsibility, we can't have a cloud security talk without uh, uh, mentioning that. In the case of serverless, the cloud provider is responsible for almost everything, from uh, the physical security of the locations, the guards, the locks, uh, uh, the, the server racks, uh, and so forth, all the way up to the container that's running the serverless runtime where your code runs. So that's a lot of tasks, security tasks, that you don't have to worry about. 
Uh, on the other hand, you still have to worry about the security of your own application. And that's your responsibility, and that's not going to change anytime soon. Nobody's going to take uh, the responsibility for the code that you are writing. Uh, and in serverless, that pretty much means the functions themselves, the functions that you write, your code, the logic, uh, as well as the identities, the access management, uh, the configuration of the cloud resources that your application uh, interacts with, and obviously the data. Um, putting it, um, I, I published this um, white paper a few months ago, uh, trying to take the list of PCI security requirements with some additional um, other requirements. Uh, th the list is uh, in a small font for a reason. Uh, it's not really um, relevant, but there's a, a huge list of tasks that when you are running your own bare metal or infrastructure as a service VMs in the cloud, you're responsible for. Um, you know, from patching the OS and hardening the OS and authenticating users and uh, you know, network segmentation and everything. That's uh, the blue part, that's you, the application owner, that uh, is responsible for. So pretty much 90% or 92% is still your responsibility. When you move to serverless, things get much better, as I mentioned earlier, and the majority of tasks related to the underlying infrastructure is now uh, under uh, the supervision or the responsibility of the cloud provider, and you're left with 48% in this case, but you see it's pretty much half and half. So from that aspect, serverless, um, gives you a great uh, starting point uh, from a security perspective. Um, I'll explain how serverless works very quickly, uh, just so I can explain some of the attack surfaces. Um, so a developer deploys code uh, through their code repository, pushes it out to the cloud, that's called a function. Um, a function is tied to uh, event sources, could be an S3 bucket uh, that changes, a database table that changes, an HTTP request, a WebSocket request that comes in, uh, telemetry data coming from an IoT device. There are plenty, I believe, 47 different event sources that can trigger AWS Lambda, uh, as an example. And that will trigger your code that will run, do its job. Usually the code is not an island. It's not isolated. It will communicate with cloud resources like buckets and databases uh, and so forth. And if everything works well, it will generate some output. Um, how can an attacker actually approach or uh, reach your business logic in the cloud given that it's deployed in your account? Uh, so we see a few paths for that happening. The first one is through the event data itself. So when the event triggers your function, it brings with it data. Um, I'll give you a very simplistic example. Uh, an HTTP request as an event trigger will bring in the data from the HTTP request, parameters, cookies, uh, you know, URLs, headers, etc. That's very easy to understand. When the event trigger is something more cloud native, like a database uh, ch uh, table that changes, or an S3 bucket that is being changed uh, or manipulated, then the event includes data from, uh, you know, whatever uh, triggers the function, and each event source has its own event format and its own encoding schemes, and so, uh, it, you know, there are enough uh, attacker or user controlled or attacker control fields uh, to manipulate. So that's one uh, way to um, manipulate your business logic. Think about a function that gets invoked by a change in an S3 bucket, then the name of the file, for example, could be uh, an attack, attacker controlled, could be the input vector in this case. Um, unauthorized deployment. Uh, and there was a, um, a Dave mentioned, uh, you know, a credentials, a cloud credentials. There are a wide, there's a wide range of attacks that an attacker can uh, pull off in order to uh, gain the ability to deploy functions to the cloud, starting with cross-site scripting to a developer's uh, machine or a phishing attack, getting the credentials and deploying the function directly, not through um, uh, your regular CI/CD pipeline. Uh, another way through the code, which is not um, by hijacking credentials, is by poisoning third-party dependencies, and this is something that we're starting to see uh, more often. Uh, there's a bunch of NPM packages that have been poisoned in the past few months, um, some, some of them to run, I believe, crypto mining code. Uh, and this is not specific for serverless. However, in a serverless environment where you don't control the underlying infrastructure, it's harder for you to know that these things are happening. Um, so in a, in a normal environment, you can monitor the third-party library, see what's it doing during runtime. In a serverless environment, uh, we'll see how you can handle that later, but 
it's a bit harder. And last but not least, as I mentioned, when these functions run, they interact with cloud services. If those cloud services are publicly available or accessible to the attacker, uh, he or she can manipulate the function. Uh, think about a function that interacts with uh, an S3 bucket during execution. If I can manipulate the content of the bucket during execution, the function will, um, you know, will be manipulated to do some other things. Uh, and what can an attacker actually achieve from this? Uh, that's pretty much normal uh, to, you know, or standard to what we're seeing in application security, uh, compromising data, abusing the business logic, bypassing authentication, leaking secrets, even denial of service is uh, a thing to, uh, uh, an issue that you need to think about uh, because these functions, when they run, they do have concurrency limits either on the function or on the account. Uh, and if I can get the function, and you'll see how we can do that in a second, if I can get the function to overwork and I can instantiate enough concurrent execution, I can choke the account and deny other users from uh, using uh, your applications. Uh, I'm not going to go over the, the list of top risks for serverless security. I've done that in this article, um, this guide that we published together with the CSA a couple of months ago, uh, called the top 12 most uh, uh, critical risks for serverless applications. Uh, these are the ones that are pretty much aligned uh, with the OWASP top 10, uh, with a few that are very unique to serverless, uh, and even those that are aligned with the OWASP top 10 have their own twist or their own um, nuances that are serverless um, uh, related. But we will see a few of those uh, live in a second. Um, there's a need for serverless native protection, um, and if you look at traditional security solutions, uh, you see that in order to deploy them, you need to have access to the underlying infrastructure. So think about uh, a web application firewall or a runtime application self-protection, or even network uh, security solutions that you use to protect the application layer. You need to deploy them somewhere, either on the network or on the host. That's how they work. Uh, in serverless, by definition, you don't own the network, you don't own the infrastructure, and so um, uh, you um, you know, you're out of luck, you're out of luck, and you, you're uh, not in liberty to deploy these solutions, which uh, means that these traditional security solutions are becoming unsuitable for serverless architectures. And to put that into a diagram, uh, if today you build an application, let's, uh, you know, uh, say it's a web app, um, you n install an EPP uh, endpoint protection on the host itself to, uh, you know, monitor the behavior, an IPS on the network, web security gateway to inspect outbound traffic from your application, a next-gen firewall, obviously, to inspect inbound traffic, and then um, um, you add a web application firewall to inspect layer seven traffic, and all of that sits on the infrastructure today, either on the network or on the server. When you go serverless, you break up the application into functions. You deploy the functions to the cloud, another word for the internet, um, and without these infrastructure-based protections, uh, and users obviously can access your functions uh, and invoke them, but so can attackers. And so without any cloud native or serverless native protection, uh, your uh, security is basically reduced to how good you wrote the code and how well your configurations were, uh, were done. And we all know that the human factor plays a big role here. Um, so we'll talk about a few of the risks, uh, and I'm glad that Dave mentioned this. Uh, identity and access management is going to be uh, the first one. Um, so let's see what the challenge with list privilege IAM roles uh, means for serverless functions. In this case, you see a, a, um, a sample of a code snippet where a developer is using DynamoDB, a NoSQL database that AWS provides, uh, and is inserting uh, data into the table using the put item um, API call. Um, if you are uh, adhering to the least privileged uh, concept, and you should be, um, you should only give the, or grant the function permissions to put items into that table. And that's something that actually uh, didn't exist uh, in monolithic uh, non-cloud applications. If you had a, a SQL server, your application would usually be able to, to do both read and write operations on the table. Um, AWS uh, IAM model uh, is very, very uh, powerful and gives you the ability to define that your function should only be allowed to put items into a very specific table. Um, so the model is very powerful, have, however, it's hard to get it right. Um, usually what developers will do, and we can discuss the reasons for that, is 
uh, grant a wildcard permission to the function. Uh, the reason developers do that um, could be um, laziness, um, lack of awareness to the problems that this is causing, and we'll see that in a second, or trying to future-proof the code. Uh, if we know that this function will be used for other things in the future and we don't want to uh, suffer the IAM permission um, error, we can just give it all of the permissions on Dynamo. Um, Quick quiz, anyone can actually name uh, and spell the correct IAM permission that you need to use in order to put items into Dynamo? Come on. At least one? <laughs> no? Uh, so um, put item, however it's spelled uh, with uh, camel casing, um, makes uh, perfect sense. Uh, and so most developers don't know that. They need to go into the documentation and find the relevant permission. It's not very easy to find that, by the way. Uh, and so that's uh, why this is happening. Now, what happens when you grant a wildcard uh, permission on Dynamo? Um, <laughs> that's very bad. Uh, so all of these permissions that you see here, uh, all of these actions are now allowed for the function. So the function can delete the table, can delete an item, uh, and we'll actually see that in a second. So, um, by the way, we ran, a, um, I think last year, we ran a scan of um, a thousand GitHub serverless projects, open source, and we found that uh, I believe 21% of them had critical problems just like this one. Uh, so this is the most common issue, and as you will see in a second, actually, if you, if you do handle it properly, IAM permissions together with the microservice-oriented architecture that serverless uh, helps you to um, um, build uh, can be terrific for security purposes. It can uh, act like bulkheads in a ship where if somebody finds a vulnerability, a very um, severe vulnerability in one function, you can pretty much limit them uh, and contain the damage uh, to one location. And we'll see that in a second. And the second arrived. Um, so back in August, uh, this is a friend of mine, Caleb Sima. How many of you know him? Uh, Oh, terrific. Uh, so Caleb uh, came out with this challenge, uh, trying to uh, sort of like a bounty hunt. He, crea he created uh, an extremely vulnerable serverless function that basically allows you to run code um, through a website and uh, offered the thousand dollars bounty to whoever manages to do some serious damage to his cloud account. Um, yeah, so uh, this is me when I saw the challenge, and of course I said, you know, this is a terrific opportunity to get some uh, uh, PR out of this, so let's try. So the nice thing about this function is that it's basically a remote code execution given to you on a silver platter, right? This is like the, the holy grail for attackers, getting remote code execution, and you'll see how frustrating this actually was in the serverless case. Uh, so the first thing I did was to run uh, the env command to get the environment variables. Um, and I saw a few variables here, um, three of which, you only see one of them, uh, are related to the session that the function has um, with the AWS environment. So when the function starts running, it assumes the role that we talked about a second ago, and it gets a session for that role. And that session is uh, um, um, denoted by three parameters, the uh, session tokens, and then a couple uh, other more, the access key and the secret key. Uh, so what I've done is I copied them, and I actually used this Mac uh, to set these environment variables locally. Why would I want to do that? Because then I can uh, impersonate the Lambda function and use its user to run whatever I want from my local machine instead of using Caleb's uh, very ugly web interface. Uh, so I've done that. I've exported the... Uh, uh, the variables, and then in order to check whether I'm now really running under the Lambda's uh, permissions, I ran the API get caller identity, and lo and behold, um, I was running as the Lambda basic execution role, which was terrific. Uh, this is me when I discovered that I am running now as Lambda. So, um, the first thing I did was to see if I can list the other functions in Caleb's account. And so I ran list functions, but then I got an access denied exception. Uh, so that was the first uh, thing that didn't quite work. Obviously, Caleb somehow hardened his uh, IAM role. And so I tried a few other things. I tried to get the source code of the function. Um, that didn't work as well. I tried to list buckets on the account. That didn't work as well. 
and then uh, we were pretty much doomed. And I was sitting for about three days uh, saying, okay, he was smart enough to lock down his IAM role. I'm not going to get anywhere with this. Uh, and so then I said, you know what? Usually um, when there's a website, there is a, an S3 bucket that stores the uh, static file, right? And usually that bucket will have the name of the domain. Uh, so I tried that, and I got an empty um, response or just an empty line out of that. And so I was thinking, wait, is an empty line a problem or is the bucket really there? And so I tried something completely different, uh, like a made up name, and I got a 404 out of that. And so I said, okay, there is a bucket, that's interesting. Let's see if I can list the contents of Caleb's bucket. And so I tried uh, list object on the bucket and I, uh, in indeed I got a list of all the files in that bucket, so that was very cool. Um, sort of like a directory listing of the old world um, uh, web servers. Uh, next I say it will be really cool if I can have write permissions on that bucket. Maybe I can write a file, so showing Caleb that I managed to store some files there. Uh, and so I don't know what went through my head when I was doing this. Uh, I decided maybe I can delete something that will prove that I have write permissions, right? Uh, well, uh, that's an overkill. <laughs> Uh, and so, <laughs> yeah, and so the next thing uh, was a phone call from Caleb that the site was down. Uh, so I deleted the index file, nobody could reach the file. Uh, on one hand, um, I was winning and nobody else can access the site. On the other hand, I came out <laughs> like an idiot. Um, and so Caleb was actually at, um, at Black Hat back then, it was uh, August, and so the site was down for five days, which was terrific for me for tweeting uh, purposes and PR. Um, so how do you get IAM permissions right? Um, and in this case, by the way, the, the S3 bucket wasn't publicly open. You couldn't do that without impersonating the Lambda role. It was the Lambda role that had the excessive permissions. Uh, first of all, you need to adopt a role per function model where each function has its own role. And think about, um, I think there's another principle called the principle of uh, single responsibility or something like that. Uh, your function should be doing something very specific and should have very specific permissions for that, and so a role per function will help you get that. Uh, think twice before uh, you use the asterisk or the wildcard, obviously. If you can, and if you're using AWS uh, and you're using SAM to deploy your serverless applications as a framework, it's a framework for deploying uh, serverless applications, you can use SAM managed policies. Um, uh, this is um, how uh, you would define that. And if you really want to screw things up, you can, uh, using SAM managed policies, give full access to the database, but you don't want to do that. Um, the right way to do that is to use a custom role per function, as I mentioned, and then basically say that this role is only allowed to put an item into that specific table. That's the right way to do things. Um, getting it right is easy on one function. It's bec it becomes a, a bit of a problem when you try to scale. And so PureSec, my company, actually offers a free open source um, code scanning tool uh, that you can scan your Lambda function code and then it will auto-generate an IAM role that is least privileged based on the static analysis of your code. So it basically extracts which APIs you're calling on what resources and generates a relevant role. Um, let's talk about App Redos uh, very quickly. How many of you know uh, Corey Quinn? Same people. <laughs> Uh, so Corey uh, is a very funny guy, uh, very cynical, and has a, a newsletter uh, that talks about AWS uh, Lambda, uh, uh, sorry, AWS bills. That's what he does, help people with their AWS bills and make it more efficient and uh, reduce costs. Uh, and his uh, newsletter is very cynical uh, and sarcastic, which is always fun to read. And he approached me a few months ago and said, you know, I have this newsletter. Uh, the registration is done through a Lambda application. Maybe you can uh, you know, hack it, if you will. I will uh, blog about uh, PureSec, um, et cetera. He did mention that it's not really doing anything important, so the, the uh, potential for damage here is very low. And so I started looking. Uh, he actually exposed the source code for this. Um, we started looking, and we saw that um, he was using, or Corey was using uh, SendGrid, uh, a very popular library for uh, doing emails. Uh, and SendGrid creates, uh, well, takes the user's email and creates an object out of that, uh, and that's using actually the uh, Python's uh, native email package. And that package 
um, supports uh, these long email formats where you have the actual name and then uh, the email. Um, and usually I say, you know, when there's a parser, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some fun uh, involved here. Uh, if you like reading RFCs, you can go through the RFC and see what this is all about. But the thing that, uh, you know, looking at the code, I figured out that that library um, will work slowly uh, if presented with very specific input, like this, uh, obviously legitimate email. Um, so I tried this, obviously in an email format, and that uh, took a few more milliseconds to run, but then if you do a 100 kilobytes long email address, um, the, the library will stall for about, I believe, two to five seconds. Um, and, well, that's good enough. Uh, now, this is not really a serverless attack, right? I'm just doing a, 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 a redos attack here. However, if you post this a thousand times concurrently, and you only need to do it once, and you can use uh, you know, a small laptop, um, you basically um, uh, take up all of the resources in the account, and you'll hit the uh, account concurrency limit, and nobody can uh, use the application or that account for that matter. And that actually uh, worked, and a few seconds uh, later, we got an internal server uh, error, uh, and uh, funny enough, um, Lambda didn't uh, recuperate from that. Uh, it took about two minutes, so the site closed down for about two minutes. Um, as promised, uh, Corey uh, wrote something, generated a spike on our, the PureSec website, and uh, everything was terrific. Uh, I'm going to skip the last uh, example. It's pretty uh, similar. Uh, you can read about it in, in our blog because I want to uh, get to the demo. And in the demo, um, I've actually created an HR application that 100% serverless running on AWS Lambda. Uh, it's very cool in the way it works. A candidate will send an email with his or her CV as a PDF file, and that uh, PDF file will get handled by the Amazon Simple Email Service, and will pass it through an SNS pub sub message to trigger my Lambda function. The purpose of Lambda in life is to extract the PDF contents, turn them into plain text, analyze the contents of, uh, or the qualifications of um, the uh, candidate, store the results in the database, and then uh, send an email back and also expose a web interface for the HR team to invite people to interviews or store their, uh, you know, archive um, their stuff. And so let's interact with this application. Give me a moment. Now, the fun thing about this is that you don't need to build an interface, it's an email. So I'll send an email, let's say, I'm a job candidate, and my name is John Smith. Um, if you want to see this, it should be better. And then my CV is attached, and I'll attach the CV. Now, the CV is a regular computer science CV. There's no malware in here hiding in the PDF, although that would be cool. Um, let's just send this. And here's the cool part. Um, remember, I'm not managing any servers right now. Uh, the email is going through, simple email service, SNS, triggers my Lambda function, does uh, textual qualification analysis, store the results in a uh, SQL database, no SQL database, sends me a receipt back, and also exposes a front-end interface for the HR team. Um, um, I think, oh, never mind should have it somewhere, uh, but trust me, it works. Uh, and so we got the uh, receipt email back. Now, let's say for the purpose of the story that we didn't get accepted to the job and we want to get our revenge, and our way of doing that is going to try to leak the database of sensitive candidate uh, information back to the cloud. So how do we do that? Uh, if this was a web-based interface, that would be pretty easy. I would spin up uh, like something like a SQL map or some fuzzing tool, start fuzzing with the different form parameters, right? Uh, however, I'm using email, and I'm not going to try to attack Amazon's email, you know, hosted email service, managed email service. I need something else. Um, if we look at, you know, the amount of uh, entry points we have to the application, it's not uh, much. We have the file itself and uh, the contents of the file. So the file name and the contents, uh, we can assume that something inside the application is using the file name, uh, maybe to copy it from one location to another or to uh, extract the contents of the PDF. And so what we'll do is we'll copy the file and we'll modify it a little bit. Uh, so I'll do 
John, semicolon, and then let's do sleep 5000 hash. Um, I'm using a trick here uh, called a time-based uh, probe. Uh, assuming that something is using the file name inside the shell interpreter environment, the semicolon sleep is going to cause that interpreter to sleep for 5,000 seconds. Uh, in most systems, that will cause a timeout. In Lambda, that will obviously cause a timeout because the default is five minutes. And that will be our signal that the system is indeed vulnerable. Um, so I'm not expecting the developer to send me any stack traces back over email, right? That's not very um, uh, um, uh, plausible. Uh, so just waiting for it. It took about 10 seconds earlier to get a response back, maybe 15 seconds. So if that's not going to happen, I'll know that my, email, uh, my uh, um, file name is a good uh, um, way to inject OS commands into uh, the environment, and, and it is. So the next thing we want to do is we want to turn this uh, black box engagement into a white box en engagement, and how do we do that? We want to get the source code of the function back, and that's probably in serverless going to be the first thing that attackers will try to do. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, so I'm actually storing uh, this thing on Pastebin where it's available uh, to anyone on the internet uh, and also to Lambda. And all this uh, Python code does is extract the name of the function, of the file name, and then it opens it up and reads the source code and sends it back as an email. Now, at this point, it's sitting in Pastebin. I need somehow to get it into Lambda and to execute. How do I do that? Uh, so very similar to what we've done with uh, the sleep command, uh, slightly more sophisticated. Uh, instead of semicolon sleep, I'm using semicolon, some ugly things, curl to fetch data from pastebin, and then pipe it into a Python child process, which is always there. Um, how do I do that? And obviously, dot .pdf at the end, because it's a legitimate file name. And then we'll send that. And in about 10 or 15 seconds, we'll get two emails back. Uh, the first one is the receipt email. The second one is the source code of the function. Now, if you look in CloudTrail, which Dave mentioned earlier, or CloudWatch, you won't see any traces to the fact that we just stole the source code. Uh, the reason is that we didn't violate any IAM policy. It's okay for the function to access its own source code and obviously to access the internet. Uh, and so we got the two emails back. Here's the source code, and we'll quickly go over it. I have a minute, uh, which should be enough. Uh, so the developer is defining some table name, uh, taking it from an environment variable. Not the best uh, security, but uh, better than hard coding. Uh, we do see it's a DynamoDB client. And then this is where the function is uh, defined. Uh, they're getting the input, getting the file, extracting the file name. Good security practice to whitelist the file name, checking that it ends with a .pdf, and then using that to actually run uh, a very common CLI tool called PDF to text, which eventually does what it says, translates PDF into plain text. Uh, however, embedding uh, untrusted user input in that command. So when we type semicolon sleep, we basically split that command into two, uh, the original uh, developer command and our own second command. Uh, and then the developer is using dynamo.put item and we'll see how we can abuse that uh, right now to get the data out uh, from the application. So how do we do that? Again, I'm storing uh, my malicious payload on pastebin. Um, just a second. There it is. Uh, my payload is very simple. It creates its own Dynamo client and then runs dynamo.scan, which is the API to scan the entire table, fetch the data. I don't even know the table name. I'm, use, I'm reusing the environment variable, which is very convenient and then dumping the data back into the response email. Uh, again, I need to somehow run this on Lambda, so we'll do this. And very similar trick to what we've done earlier, curl, fetch the data from pastebin, and pipe it into the Python 3 child process, and we'll run this. Here's the trick. Uh, the developer uh, should have given the function only the put item permissions, but as you've seen, it's very popular to give it a bit more. Uh, one of those permissions was the ability to run dynamo.scan, uh, and that is what uh, the problem here uh, was. Um, in about 10 seconds, we'll get the entire dump of the database table back. Keep in mind that it took us three emails uh, from probing to 
full exfiltration of the database, very under the radar, doesn't require like thousands of HTTP requests using SQL maps to exfiltrate the data. And if somebody asks you, is it possible to inject uh, and exfiltrate data from a NoSQL cloud native database, uh, here's the uh, proof. Obviously, it required two things from us. One is the ability to inject OS commands, and the second one was the bad permissions. And here you see the, 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 um, you know, the real problem. Uh, if the developer uh, or would have given the function only the put item permissions, the only thing we would be able to do is insert items into the table. But the developer gave it a bit more uh, than what was needed. So, a uh, quick take action. Right, so I prepared this uh, short list. This is a good uh, Twitter photo op moment. Yeah, go ahead. Don't forget to tag me. Um, the first one is the uh, CSA top 12 serverless security risks that I mentioned. Uh, it covers AWS, Google Cloud, IBM Cloud functions, and Azure functions um, um, uh, topics as well. The AWS Lambda Security Best Practices book that I published a few months ago OS Serverless Goat uh, is a terrific example. It's a live application with a single click of a button. You can deploy it on AWS uh, through the app repo uh, and learn how to um, you know, attack and defend your serverless applications. You can then show off your skills to your uh, teammates. Uh, I mentioned the, um, actually, I missed that, but uh, Function Shield is a free library that developers can use to tame open source uh, dependencies uh, on serverless environments. Uh, and uh, have a look at um, you know, the serverless security platforms that are available. Uh, there are a few options other than CureSec uh, as well. That's it. Thank you.